this is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. My mind's alert. My heart's receptive to receive the uncompromising, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For this is God's Word speaking to me. Look to your neighbor and say, this is God's Word speaking to you. So be a doer of the Word and not just a hearer only. You may be seated if you can. Hallelujah. My goodness. We got a pretty good, I don't know if you noticed that, but we got a pretty good praise and worship team. Come on, let's give them a hand. If you're going to give it to them, give it to them. Hallelujah. He saw me switch up a while ago, and I was going to preach down there, but I didn't, that little podium didn't give me quite enough room. I, I'm teaching out of two Bibles tonight, so I'm giving you a double barrel tonight, fully loaded. <laughs> so we're going to have a good time tonight in the Word of God, and uh, I felt like this is, of course, God-ordained, and uh, so I know you're going to enjoy it because I've enjoyed preparing for it. Amen. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Jude. The book of Jude is only one, cha uh, one book. It's one chapter. So we're going to try to go through that tonight. And the title of my message is called Beware of Apostasy. There's a lot of teaching in here on apostate and apostasy. So we're going to dive into that tonight. And... Um, the title is uh, Beware of Apostasy. Now, apostasy is many different definitions on apostasy. Uh, Greek translation, a few of those is um, to defect, uh, desertion, to rebel against. Also means to abandon true faith. Um, hypocrisy, uh, apostasy also means false teachers, worldliness, denying Christ, unbelief or unbelieving, Forsaking worship. Forsaking worship. And we talked about, we had a, did a message on worship about worship is a godly lifestyle. But forsaking worship, um, moral lapse in judgment. And this was interesting. And uh, uh, defective knowledge of Christ. Defective knowledge of Christ. Let me talk about that for a minute. It's not a defective Christ, because there's no such thing, but defective knowledge of Christ. And I was thinking about that, you know, and um, sometimes, you know, you order a crib or, or whatnot, and, and, and you know, when you order stuff on Amazon, a lot of times it comes in boxes, and something you got to put them together. But, and if you don't read the directions, or understand the directions, you just start putting something together like us men like to do. I don't know if it's because we don't like being told what to do or think we just can handle it without <laughs> reading directions, but how many have been in that situation several times? And then you had to go back, take it apart, and start over again. <laughs> I know I've done the same thing. <laughs> we don't like reading directions. I don't know what it is, but we can look at a picture and we think we got it. But when you, you know, it, it, if you don't know how to put that thing together, if it don't work for you, or it, it, like you, you know, you can order engines online. I know Andrew Brazy ordered four-wheelers, uh, and they came in pieces, and he had to put them together. I thought that was pretty impressive to do that. But if you, if, if you get the parts and you get the right directions, and, but you don't follow the directions, and you put it together or you try to put it together, it's not a defection on the part of the product. The defection is in the knowledge of the product. It's not knowing the product. Knowing how the product works, knowing how to put it together. So it's the same way with the Word of God, defect, defective knowledge of Christ. It's not that Christ's Word is defective. It's just that we don't have a full understanding if, you're not, if the Word is not working for you, if it's not producing life in you, if, you're not, if it's not producing the promises of God that He promises us, then it's not a part of defectiveness on Christ. The defectiveness is on us the knowledge of us not understanding what Christ has promised us. Do you understand? 
So defective knowledge of Christ is one of the definitions of apostasy. So we're going to get right into the word here. Let's look in, we're going to start with uh, verse 1. And it says, Jude, which was a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And this is who he was writing the letter to. It says, to those who are called, sanctified by God and the Father and pres preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So Jude was sending a letter to what you called born-again Christians. He was sending a letter, he was writing a letter to the church. So let's look at verse 3. It says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you, which means lifting you up or encouraging you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, what I get out of that is Jude was planning on writing a little something different. He was planning on writing something about common salvation. And it says here in the study Bible, the verse implies that Jude had intended to write a letter on salvation as the common blessing enjoined by all believers, perhaps to emphasize unity and fellowship among all believers and to remind them that God is no respect no person. But he was compelled instead to write a call to battle for the truth in light of the arrival of apostate teachers. So what here Jude is saying is, hey, I intend to write to you about common salvation, but I think it's more important that I write to you concerning apostasy. That's what he's saying. So if Jude thought it was necessary to write it, I think it's, it was necessary for me to read it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to teach it to you. <laughs> Amen? So it says in here, verse 4, it says that, um, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, which is talking about the church, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God. We've had a lot of teaching on grace. You've heard a lot of teaching on grace. Who turn the grace of our God into lewdness, which is gross immorality or uh, some type of shameless lifestyle, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, certain men go and notice these were people that were infiltrating. They were false teachers pretending to be true, who on the surface looked like the real thing, but whose intentions were leading people astray. Amen? Now, we, have a, we live in a society where we have a lot of accessibility to, to good teaching, but there's a lot of accessibility to bad teaching. So, and, you know, especially Christians, you know, we can, just because you hear somebody preaching doesn't mean that's the true word of God. I mean, you got churches now that are changing their bylaws to accommodate sinful lifestyle. You got, you got, non, I mean, you got denominational churches that are changing their bylaws to accommodate homosexuality, to, to appease them. But, you know, that's not what the word of God says. So, you know, here at Victory Life Church, we're going to teach what the Word of God says. Amen. 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 So it says here in verse 5, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now, you've heard that story before. You know that the children of Israel were rescued and uh, Moses took them out of the land of Egypt. And... And the promise, what God intended for them to do was go to the promised land. That was his intentions. I'm going to give you a land of milk and honey. But because of their disobedience, listen to me now, because of their disobedience, the people that were rescued out of Egypt, they didn't ever see the promised land. 
The ones that were 20 years and older were not allowed to go into the promised land. Even Moses didn't go into the promised land. And that was because of their own disobedience. Amen? So we're going to go back into that in just a few minutes because there's another verse that goes into that. But it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode or left their own dwelling place, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, what he's talking about here, he's, he's, he's explaining that, you know, the, the same got kicked out of heaven. There was a battle up there with uh, the archangel, Michael, and they, they kicked Satan and his angels out of heaven. And it says here, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. You don't hear a lot of teaching on the judgment. There is going to be a judgment. The Bible talks about, there's many, a lot about being, there's going to be a judgment. God is going to judge the people when the rapture takes place. Amen? The rapture is coming. God is coming back for his people, and there's going to be a judgment day. And it says here, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, listen to this, as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Eternal fire is everlasting hell. There are people that are going to hell. Hell is real. Heaven is real. Everybody knows heaven is real, but some people don't believe hell is real. Hell is real. Amen? So he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah here. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember, that was the reason he destroyed that city is because of basically sexual immorality. It had gotten way out of hand. How many of you know sexual immorality is getting way out of hand? I mean, it's, it's, it's perverted. I saw on the news yesterday a, a daycare and a police officer was conspiring to have... Uh, sex with a 12-year-old girl for years at a daycare. This is, this is local around here, Newport News. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, it's. But it says here in Sodom and Gomorrah, now let me, it says as, as an example. Sodom and Gomorrah as an example. So in other words, you could say it like this. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed the whole city except for Lot and his family which his wife ended up looking back and turned into a pillar of salt. But as this scripture says, it's really a preview of what's coming. Amen. Sodom and Gomorrah is a preview of what's coming. Amen? It says here in, uh, let me see if I can find it in the study Bible. It says Sodom and Gomorrah, as the scripture illustrates, God's judgment during the days of Abraham and Lot. The destruction was in view of their apostasy. Since it occurred, listen to this. Now, it occurred about 450 years after the flood, when at least one of Noah's sons was still living. Because it was only 100 years after Noah died that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that they had been taught the judgment of Christ because of the flood. But they refused. They rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen? You follow me? So it says here, strangely, I have set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Likewise, also these dreamers, also these dreamers defile the flesh. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Now let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. This message tonight is kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's a Bible study. You, you know, uh, I look at it kind of like when you do the maintenance on your car, you change the oil in it, and sometimes you get it tuned up. It's the same thing. You know, this is kind of maintenance. This is like Holy Ghost maintenance. Amen? Amen. So we're changing spiritual oil tonight. <laughs> So if Jude thought it was necessary to write this, then I think it was necessary for us to, to read it and understand it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it seems to be 2 Peter chapter 2, 
verses 10 through 12. It says, And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reveling accusation against them before the Lord. Now let's look here in verse 11. I'm going to skip verse 10. We may come back to that. But verse 11 says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. You remember Cain, right? Killed Abel. Have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, the era of Balaam was uh, for a large financial reward. Balaam de devised a plan for Balak, which was, Balak was king of Moab. Balaam devised a plan to entice Israel into a compromising, into a compromising situation with idolatry and immorality, which would bring God's own judgment on his people. That's what is, he's talking about people in the last days, the apostasy, the, uh, the false teachers, the, uh, the counterfeit Christians. He's describing them as the same people that were in the days of their age. Amen? Amen. So it says here, um, Jewish leaders rejected, no, that's a, it says, into compromised situations, which would bring God's own judgment on his people. Now, on, it says, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now let's look at that. This is, uh, this is important. Numbers, let's go to Numbers chapter 16. I want you to see this yourself. Are you still with me? In the last days, there are going to be perilous times. Amen? There's going to be... Men in sheep's wools, right? Preachers in sheep's wools. All right, here we go. Let's look at, um, I'm going to skip around just to save some time. Um, I had originally wanted to read a little bit more, but let's look at, um, let's look at verse 2. And they rose up before Moses. Um, well, in verse 1 it says, Korah and the son of so-and-so. Korah and his men, let's look at verse 2. Korah and his men rose up before Moses and some of them, children of Israel, there was 250 leaders of the congregation. Representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron. So here we have Korah and his people are coming against Moses. You know, Moses was the leader that got him out of Israel, who God appointed, right? Now let's look down and then let me just explain, let me paraphrase this a little bit. Moses had an, a confrontation or argument or he was listening to the complaints of Korah. Korah was saying, Who do you, why do you think you're above us? Why do you think you're called to do this? So let's look at verse 16. And it says, And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Aaron was on the side of Moses. In verse 20, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. God's saying, Get away from them. Separate yourself from them. They're causing division in your church. They're causing strife. Amen? They're causing jealousy. Amen. They're being ungodly, right? So let's look at verse 28. And Moses said, by this, talking to Korah, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all the things of these works. For I have not done them of my own will. Verse 29 says, if these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me to do this. But verse 30 says, but... If the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord God. 
Now let's look at verse 31. Now it came to pass. As soon as he stopped speaking, as soon as he finished speaking, all these words, the ground split apart under them. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah and with all of their goods. So Jude was trying to explain to the church that ungodly men may creep in. But God's judgment will be upon them sooner or later. So he's explaining to them that he was, he was comparing the people in that church that was causing division to the people with Moses. You follow me? Now let's look at verse 12. Let's go back to verse 10. It says, but these, I don't think, did I skip this one? Verse 10 says, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. You know, some people know it all. Some people know it all, right? But he's talking about basically the world here. There's people that are um, intellectually arrogant and spiritually ignorant. You know, you can have people that are smart, got good common sense, they're smart intellectually, but spiritually they, they don't have a clue. Right. Amen? Yeah. So that's what he's talking about here. And let's go to verse 12. These are spots in your love feast. These are ones that's going to stick out in your love feast. Now, love feast back then, um, it, was a, it was a common thing where uh, people would gather together and they would have, uh, you know, a bread and a cup, and they would have uh, also they would have a common they would have a common meal together. Churches would get together and have a it's kind of like us having a friends' day, a picnic. But while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, he's talking, still talking about apostates here. Apostates, they are listen to this: clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn, trees without fruit. Amen? Twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, fo foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. If you got, can you pull that up on the Message Bible? I want you to see this in the Message Bible. If they got it, I didn't write it down. But anyway, Jews spends a lot of time here describing the people that are they're, 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 they're apostates here, the people that are ungodly. So he says, like uh, clouds without water. Do they have it here in the Message Bible? It's Jude, it's uh, Jude 12 and 13. There we go. It says, nope, it's 12 and 13. Well, we'll go on. Okay, those people, those spots, some of those people are warts on your love feast. As you worship and eat together, they're giving you a black eye, carousing shamelessly, grabbing anything that isn't nailed down. They're puffs of smoke pushed by gusts of wind. Late autumn trees stripped clean of leaf and fruit. That means they'll never produce. Amen? Doubly dead. I don't know what that means. You're dead, you're dead, but doubly dead. <laughs> Pulled up by the roots. Wild ocean waves leaving nothing on the beach but the foam of their shame and lost stars in outer space on their way to the black hole. Amen. You know, there is a black, there are black holes in the space. Amen. And you know, they, the scientists still ain't figured out when, they, when a black hole ends up getting a star that has diminished they cannot find out where it goes. There's no trace of it. Once it goes in that black hole, it's over. It's done. It doesn't come out somewhere else. It's, just, it's over. Yeah. Scientists can't figure that out. But anyway, it says here, clouds without water. This is apostates. This is promised spiritual life, but are empty clouds which bring the hope of rain, but actually deliver nothing but dryness and death. And trees without fruit or apostates hold out the claim of providing a spiritual feast, but instead deliver famine. 
Dead trees, doubly dead trees will never yield fruit and regardless of what they say will always be barren because they are uprooted. Raising waves. Apostates promise powerful ministry but are quickly exposed as wreakers of havoc and workers of worthless shame. And wandering stars is this. These most likely refers to a meteor or shooting star which has an uncontrolled moment of brilliance and then fades away forever into nothing. Amen? Apostates promise enduring spiritual direction but deliver a brief, aimless, worthless flash. That's what's going to be happening in the last days. So always know, always know the Word of God. And that's the best way to, to see if somebody is teaching you the Word of God is to know the Word of God yourself. Amen? Amen. That's the best way to do it is get into the Word. Amen. Study it. Meditate on it. Amen? Hallelujah. It says here in verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all. How many? Who's going to be execute judgment on? All. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, Let's look at what he talks about being people that are ungodly. <laughs> he describes some of them in verse 16. What are they? They are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. I said they're mouth swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. They tell people what they want to hear for their own profit rather than proclaiming what the true word of God says. Amen? They speak arrogantly, even magnificently, but with empty, lifeless words of no spiritual value. And it's void of the powerful, uh, powerful substance of the word of God. So let's move on here. Verse 17, it says, But you, listen to this, thank God for us, but you... Beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. How they told you that there would be mockers. Mockers are people to ridicule, imitate, mimic. In other words, they're counterfeit. They'll be counterfeit in the last time who will walk according to their own ungodly lust. In other words, they're going to walk after their own desire. Self-satisfaction. We're living in a day, folks, of self-satisfaction. Amen? These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the Spirit. Verse 20 says, now verse 20 and 22, we can breathe a little bit. This is, <laughs> this is going back to what I think Jude initially wanted to, to write when he says... I was going to write to you about common salvation. This is the good part of this. It says in verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith. How do you build yourself up? Praying in the Holy Spirit. You want to build yourself up in faith? Pray in the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, Keep yourself in the love of God. How do you do that? Pray in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, if praying in the Holy Spirit is going to keep me from bickering, complaining, reveling, if it's going to keep me from walking according to my own flesh, Amen. then I don't think there's nothing wrong with praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen. The more you pray in the Holy Spirit, the better person you're going to be. 
the better Christian you're going to be. Yes. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And, on, and it says this, and on some have compassion, and you have to make a distinction. What I gather for that is there are going to be some Christians, of course, they're baby, they're babies in Christian, have compassion for them. You know, they don't know a whole lot. They don't, they don't, they don't have the knowledge of the Word of God because they haven't been saved long enough to understand the Word of God. Let's, let's read it and understand it. But then you're going to have people that have been being saved for a long time that still use scriptures to justify their lifestyle. Right. Right. Those are the ones that says, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Amen. Amen? It says this in verse 23, but others save. Okay, verse 24, now to him who is able, God is able. I said God is able. To keep us from stumbling, Amen. how does he do that? If we pray in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. Amen. To keep us from stumbling and to present you faultless. Woo. Amen. Look to your spouse and say, you're perfect. <laughs> you're faultless. Before the presence, listen to this, before the presence of his glory it didn't say with joy. It said with exceeding joy. Let's look at 1 Peter 1.8. It's just a little bit to your left. Now, let's start in, uh, let's start in verse 7. It says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, and be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, you are going to be tested. We all know we go through trials and tribulations. But here it says if you go through it and you give praise, honor, and glory to God, not only, though, not only is that edifying you, but it's giving glory to God. Amen? Amen? So whom, having not seen, you love. Even though you hadn't seen God in this place, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing. So when you believe, you rejoice. With joy inexpressible and full of glory. Some of you ain't getting that. Come on up, singers. Listen to this. Let me read it again. Yet believing, when you believe, you rejoice Amen. with joy, unexpressible and full of glory. Amen. There's power in joy. Yeah, yeah. I said there's power in joy. Yeah. You know, joy is the dominant expression in heaven. Amen. Joy is the dominant expression in heaven. So when you want to bind something on earth, like it's bound in heaven, you rejoice about it. So when you want to lose something on earth that's already been loosed in heaven, you rejoice about it. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Your strength comes through joy. Joy is the dominant expression in heaven. So you want to make, get connected and stay connected to the Heavenly Father, the best way to do that is through your joy. Amen. Not through somebody else's joy. Amen. It's through your joy, Amen. which is the dominant expression in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I said your joy is the dominant expression in heaven. How many of you are joyful tonight? Amen. I said how many are you joyful tonight? I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to wind this up. Let's go back to 1 Peter. I'm going to look at verse 13 and 15 from chapter 1. Y'all get ready. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, I, I researched that. It says gird up the loins. That was a phrase like, uh, like we would say, roll up your sleeves today. Because back in the day, everyone, male and female, they would wear tunics. They would wear tunics. Even the men would wear tunics. And they would wrap, they would, they would wrap their loose articles in their, 
they're loose, they would even roll their, the bottom of their robes up and tie it with the belt because they could be more free, especially in work, you know, because the, 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 it's like a gown. And they didn't want that. So it says, gird up your loins of your mind. In other words, they would tighten things up. So I encourage you tonight to tighten things up in your mind. Amen? It says, tighten things up in your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance when you did that, but as he who called you is holy, you also should be holy in all your conduct. Or should I say half your conduct? Some of your conduct you should be holy. It says to be holy in all of your conduct. Amen? Not some of your conduct, all of your conduct. Let's stand and give God praise right now. Let's stand and give God praise. I said let's stand and give God praise. Things happen when you give God rejoice. When you rejoice in the Lord, things happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory.